Tim Lehman is a field biologist, explorer, photographer, and filmmaker. His first National Geographic article was in 1997 after 10 years working in the rainforest canopy of Borneo, and he has published over 20 feature stories since. He's received a list of awards, prizes, and recognition over the years, including receiving the coveted Wildlife Photographer of the Year Award in 2016. When we approached him on this project, we were unsure of what his response would be to our request. Actually, we were like, um, he works in Borneo, so. Um, but we were so delighted that you said not only yes, um, but gave us an enthusiastic yes. So thank you for that. Over two years, Tim visited Sunnylands eight times, uh, helping us document some of the many species we see as residents and those coming through on the Pacific Flyway. We've asked him to share both his experiences with this project and his career as a whole for our community. And so I'm happy to introduce to you Tim Lehman. Thanks, Micheline, and welcome, everybody. It's great to see you all here today in beautiful uh, Palm Springs, Palm Desert. Uh, I'd like to start, <laughs> since Micheline kind of set up the uh, introduction, mentioning uh, my background in Borneo. I thought it'd be appropriate to show you the rainforest of Borneo. It's a little more humid than... Uh, around here. Uh, these are some hornbills up in the canopy, one of my favorite subjects for photography there. And yeah, so I spend a lot of my time uh, going to places like this, uh, documenting the wildlife of rainforests uh, around the world. Uh, I also have worked on projects in colder places, like in Japan. I was actually born in Japan, and I really enjoyed going back there a number of years ago to photograph Japanese uh, red crown cranes. Uh, and the snow monkeys for a National Geographic uh, story. One of the monkeys enjoying the outdoor hot springs there in the uh, Nagano area. I also do a lot, quite a bit of diving and underwater photography. I love the, the diverse places where there's a lot of uh, rich life, whether it's the rainforest or the coral reefs. And one of my longest time uh, term collaborators is my wife Cheryl, Cheryl Mott, uh, and my, that's my daughter Jessica on the right there, and we also have a son, and we've been going to, my wife Cheryl is a researcher out at Boston University. Uh, she studies wild orangutans in Borneo, and so we've been working together for over 25 years, going to the rainforest of Borneo, and we've done, I think, three articles in National Geographic about orangutans, as well as a National Geographic film, and uh, so you may have seen some of, some of our, our stories. This is a, a youngster. The orangutans, the juveniles, stay with their mother for a very long time. They have a long developmental period, but the males are off by themselves, uh, generally solitary like this big guy. Uh, so one of the things that I do uh, for my work, especially in rainforests, where there are a lot of big trees and the wildlife is up in the canopy, is I do a lot of uh, tree climbing work. Didn't really have to do that here in, in Sunnylands, but I wanted to show you a little bit about, what, give you a sense of what that's like. Uh, so I use climbing harness and uh, equipment for ascending ropes. So I, I get the rope up in the tree first using a bow and arrow and shooting, shoot by shooting a fishing line over and pulling my rope up. And then I put on this harness and I uh, climb trees like this <coughs> uh, using ascenders. But it's very safe because I'm attached to <laughs> two points of attachment to the rope and uh, I work my way up into the canopy and it allows me to get unusual perspectives. Uh, on the forest, like this beautiful uh, sunrise view of the, or before sunrise view of the misty, misty canopy there. One of the shots that I took up in the canopy was this one, uh, and I wasn't actually up there, the wrong times wouldn't come that close to me if I was there uh, actually by myself in the canopy, but I used a remote camera, a little GoPro camera that I hid up in, the, up in this tree, so I had to climb the tree repeatedly, but it was a tree that I thought the wrong times would come back to, to get more food, there was a lot of fruit up above this. And so I uh, waited at the ground for the orangutans to come back and, and, and took the picture at the right moment. One of the other subjects that I've worked on besides the orangutans for many years now uh, is the birds of paradise. So I've been working with my colleague Ed Scholes from Cornell and going to uh, New, the New Guinea region. So birds of paradise are not only a plant that grows in California very well, but the, they're actually named after these, these amazing birds that are uh, from the New Guinea region, both the Indonesian part and the Papua New Guinea. 
And the, you know, Birds of Paradise are this family of birds that's incredibly diverse, colorful. This is called Wilson's Bird of Paradise. This is the 12-wired Bird of Paradise, a very unusual one with these strange feathers coming out around its uh, backside there. And uh, this is the greater Bird of Paradise, one of the, one of the famous species with these amazing colorful plumes. So I've uh, been going back to the New Guinea region, uh, over 25 expeditions so far over the last uh, like 12 years. So about, two, about twice a year I've been going to the New Guinea region working on various Bird of Paradise projects, whether I uh, did two stories for National Geographic, a film for National Geographic, and uh, fairly a couple of years ago I, I worked on a film for the BBC. You might have heard of Planet Earth 2, uh, and you might have seen this sequence that I filmed. This is a, a little segment that's in the Jungles episode <laughs> of Planet Earth 2. And this male, Red Bird of Paradise, he's trying very hard to impress this female. <laughs> I'm not sure if he's quite succeeding. But he's very determined. <laughs> he's not given up yet. <laughs> I think he was just a little too pushy. <clears throat> but that's what Birds of Paradise are all about. It's all about female choice. That's how these males got all these amazing plumes. It's because the females are choosing the males with the best colors and ornaments uh, over time. Um, and most recently, I did a story for National Geographic that just was published last September about this remarkable bird. It's called the helmeted hornbill. It's found in Indonesia and uh, Thailand. And uh, this male is flying up toward the nest cavity. The nest is in that hole there in the upper left. And this bird has a very uh, unique breeding system. The female goes inside the nest cavity in a big hollow tree, and she actually stays in there. She actually seals the opening, uh, except for a small slit. And you can see her there, over on the lower right, you can see the female's beak uh, peering out there from that opening. She stays inside for five months. That's how long it takes this big bird to incubate the egg for about six weeks or so, and then raise the chick. So uh, the entire time, the male brings food to feed both the chick and the, and the female. Uh, and uh, this bird is a critically endangered species because it's been hunted for its horn. <clears throat> and so I did a story for National Geographic trying to spread awareness about that uh, crisis. So, uh, and I'm, one of the current projects I'm working on that I'm going back to Panama in February uh, where there are some really unique coral reefs with these, just one example, one of the endemic corals that's only found in that region uh, around the island of Coiba in the west coast of Panama, or the Pacific coast of Panama. Uh, and so I've been working on an underwater project down there with a really rich marine ecosystem that I'm uh, continuing to uh, go down for um, in the coming months. But as Micheline said, so I, I you know, frequent these uh, mostly tropical climates and uh, underwater and rainforests, um, but I was offered this amazing opportunity to come here to uh, the Coachella Valley uh, to Sunnylands to document the bird life there. And to me it was a really exciting opportunity to do something maybe a little bit closer to home. Also, I almost actually have hardly done any projects in the United States. Almost all my photography for the geographic and others has been international. So I, I thought it would be really fun to photograph birds here in America. And also, I really think that the, what the Annenbergs did, uh, as I know that you, those of you that were here last year learned from McLean, but what the Annenbergs did to landscape for birds is something that I think is increasingly important to be aware about, that you know, as humans are taking over more and more of the planet, leaving space for wildlife, helping to create habitat for wildlife is, is so important. So I thought this is a great chance to support that kind of uh, approach and document the bird life there. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share with you some of, my, some of the images um, that are over in the gallery uh, and tell you a little bit more about you know, my process, about how I go about photographing them, how, how I went about making the pictures, the kind of approach that I use to, to document the bird life here in Sunnylands. And so I'm gonna, you know, some of you may be more into photography and the technical stuff. I'm gonna cover, a, we'll show you a little bit of you know, equipment and talk a little bit about what I did, but in general, I'm gonna try to tell you kind of you know, how I go about approaching a project like this. So I use uh, two, kind of two camera systems for this project because I was doing still photography 
and video, okay, at the same time, or alternating. And so my main camera I used the most was, uh, was this big telephoto lens, a 400-2.8 with a Canon still camera. Uh, I kind of always had that handy, uh, using off a monopod to help balance the weight. One of the unique things about this assignment was that I, I got to use a golf cart <laughs> to carry my equipment around. Now, usually in the jungle, I don't have a golf cart handy <laughs> to carry my equipment around, so I can't bring around as much equipment. So, but here I could have my big, this big lens, I could have another big camera, my sort of filming camera, a big tripod. You know that place on the back of the golf cart? I think it's for putting your golf clubs, <laughs> but it works really well for big tripods. There's like a little strap to tie it in. Uh, and so I had, all my, I had this golf cart just loaded down with all my camera gear, and I was able to have like two camera systems ready to go at the same time, so I could have my still camera and then my movie camera, uh, which is, I use this Red Digital Cinema camera, which is a very uh, powerful uh, tool that allowed me to film, uh, create the film that if you've been to the gallery or hope you'll go there later, uh, you'll see the short film that I made for, to go along with the, with the photo exhibit. And it can, I can, the great thing about this camera is, is that it's such high resolution that every frame of the video is actually just as good a quality or even better than my still camera. And so some of the prints, about a third of them that you see over in the gallery, were actually made from frames from the movie camera. And so it allows me to shoot in slow motion and uh, you know, capture the... Uh, Action, I'm going to show you a couple of clips as well. So those are the main tools that I used. Uh, and the kind of approach that I used, I had, I would say, three different sort of strategies for photographing birds. So <clears throat> the first one is, you could call it the kind of run-and-gun approach, kind of driving around in a golf cart or walking around on foot, sort of looking for birds and looking for opportunities. That's probably what most people imagine, you know, is what most wildlife photographers do, which is actually not mostly what we do which I'll explain in a minute. But this is an example of, yes, I was just kind of exploring the property, looking around, seeing where the birds are, seeing what's going on, and I spotted these house finches, uh, a flock of them around the house, uh, landing on this cactus and kind of flitting around, and I sort of thought, hey, this is kind of cool. They're landing on the tops of the cactus, and I got, I got you know, into position and kind of waited until I had one on each cactus and got this shot. So this is kind of just an opportunistic um, type of approach. The second approach, or, or focus, really, that I use at Sunnylands, because there are about a dozen ponds throughout the, you know, on the Sunnylands grounds that are real magnets for the waterfowl and other water birds. And so I focus quite a bit of attention on those bodies of water, both by either kind of coming, about, coming up at a distance and you know, seeing what was there, and then maybe sneaking up on the pond, like on foot or crawling, to get close without disturbing the, the waterfowl. Uh, or sometimes I use a blind, so like a, a small tent, camouflage tent that I put ahead of time and went and got in early in the morning before it got light and then waited for the ducks to come in, which often would, would come in um, you know, early in the morning from wherever they were roosting. And then the third approach that I'm going to talk about is where I'm waiting at some kind of a resource, often like a flower, like these uh, desert marigolds that this goldfinch is feeding on, and where there's a flower source and you know, birds, especially hummingbirds, are coming to the flowers, then I would sort of stake those out and wait. So those are kind of my three approaches, kind of running and gunning and you know, focusing on the water and focusing on the, on the, on the flowers. <clears throat> the one important thing was that I was, I was always out at dawn. Uh, one thing as a wildlife photographer, the early morning, usually the best time of day for both for the light and for bird activity. So I never missed being out at sunrise. And often we had beautiful sunrises, so I took a few pictures of the sunrises as well. Uh, <clears throat> And, uh, but one of the things that I spotted one afternoon as I was moving around the, the grounds was I saw all these ravens just like soaring and doing these cool, look how these ravens are flipping upside down as part of their, an aerial kind of, I think maybe like a courtship display uh, that they're doing. Uh, <coughs> another common bird that was pretty reliable to see is a red-tailed hawk that I could reliably find. I kind of learned which trees they often hung out in. I had a lot of help from Micheline and other grounds people who showed me where some of the known locations were for some of the birds on the property. And so uh, I often went out and, and tried to see what the, you know, I would check on the hawk, see if he was in a good place, see if he was hunting, see what he was doing. And one day I saw 
uh, the hawk being chased by this uh, western kingbird. So this is a phenomenon called mobbing. That's quite common in songbirds and other small birds. They, you know, a hawk can't really catch a small bird that, that comes at it from behind or that knows it's there. It's not that maneuverable. So uh, maybe this kingbird felt like the hawk was in its territory or closer to its nest or something like that. And, the, and these little birds will actually, you know, they're trying to chase away the hawk even though he's way bigger than him. And they actually dive bomb. And here he actually actually packed the hawk on the back of his head. <clears throat> so I got these shots. This is just by hand-holding, you know, seeing the birds flying and quickly focusing and tracking and, and, and firing off birds. <clears throat> so one of the other hawks that we have there, the uh, red-shouldered hawk, and uh, I, they're a little bit harder to find, but are generally around quite a bit. And I would often look for their favorite perches in the early morning to see if I could find one. They, they had certain spots that they liked, trees that they liked to perch in. So this is an example of one morning uh, I, I saw the bird on the right. You know, he was perched on that, on that tree, and I just waited for him to... I knew that eventually he's going he's gonna to take off. And so I just waited, and then just when he left, I, I hit the shutter, and I got these two, two shots of him as he took off from the tree. Another one of the small birds of prey, a little bit smaller bird of prey, the Cooper's hawk, is also resident. Uh, okay, that wasn't good, but looks like we're back. <coughs> so the Cooper's hawk, I also found kind of where they hang out, in this, this grove of pines around one of the ponds was a, pot, a favorite hangout of the Cooper's hawk, and I would try to go, and when I went by that area, I would check and see if I could find him. Uh, and my goal was, that, you know, I got a shot of him in the, tr in the tree there, but I wanted to try to get a, sh a flight shot of him. And eventually, after many tries, I did manage to catch him on the wing. So this is just a matter of kind of waiting, watching him, and then see, wait for him, waiting for him to fly to the next tree, and hopefully being in the right position to, to get him in frame and, and in focus while he, while he went past. So that's the, the Cooper's hawk. And then the smallest uh, little bird of prey that we have here is the kestrel, beautiful little bird. Uh, and here he is, he's, he's captured a, uh, I think it's a chrysalis or a caterpillar, something like that, um, that he's uh, eating. And so during one of my visits, this guy was around a lot in one part of the grounds, and I was able to go by and check on him and say, okay, there he is, he's up in that tree, but the light's not that good, and I would come back later, and, and so I really wanted to try to get a shot of him in flight because uh, he's such a beautiful bird when his wings are open. But I found that uh, even though I could locate him many times, actually tracking him when he flew, he's so much quicker than the big hawks and didn't really soar, so it was much harder to actually catch him on the wing. So I used a slightly different approach, which was I just studied his patterns of behavior. And birds are really creatures of habit. Once you see a, a bird like this and you see him on this perch, and he you know, moves around, you see him flying around hunting to different places, he's really likely to go back to the same perches. So I found another perch that I liked, that I saw him go to, uh, and one day when there was a nice blue sky in the background, I sort of just waited there for him to come in for a landing. And I had actually already framed up the shot ahead of time, right? And I was just waiting for, I was watching him as he moved from tree to tree around the property, and then I saw him, and he was flying back toward this tree, and I just hoped that he was gonna land on the same exact spot. And so just as he, before he even got to the frame, I started pushing the button and like boom, 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 boom. And I got the shot of him just with his wings flared like that for the landing. So that's the kind of, you know, approach that I use to get a shot like this. It, it takes, you know, some people say it takes the patience. Yeah, maybe I waited there for an hour for him to come back around. But, you know, my goal is to get a few good shots, not just like a bunch of lousy shots. So I don't mind spending a few hours or a morning just to get one good shot like this. All right. <clears throat> Another little uh, bird of prey, really, who hunt, that hunts insects and lizards and things, uh, but on the ground is the roadrunner, of course. And so, uh, yeah, roadrunners are resident there on the grounds, and I, I found out there is where a couple of them were, were seen regularly. And one morning, as I walked into the desert garden area, uh, in the early morning, he hadn't really started you know, foraging yet. He was, this, this individual was, uh, he was actually perched on the back of a bench. He was, he was sitting on a bench. Uh, and I didn't really want to get the bench in the picture, so I just kind of kept getting closer and closer, really slowly, with my biggest lens, um, and he just kind of tolerated my presence until I got close enough to get this close up. But I think he was getting a little nervous, which is why he probably flared his crest up and showed off his red, uh, his red skin patch there. 
But I also had an idea of how can I photograph the Roadrunner kind of in an interesting way, besides getting a nice portrait. Because uh, <coughs> he called the Roadrunner, it'd be kind of cool to get him running, but I didn't want to do the same approach as with a flying bird, of just freezing, every, freezing the motion, because the background where he usually ran was not that attractive. It was kind of a messy background. And a frozen, sharp image you know, wouldn't be very appealing. And so I tried this technique called the pan blur technique, where you, use a sl you purposely use a slow shutter speed, in this case about a 30th of a second, to uh, track with the running you know, bird and fire off images. And the key thing is to track with him perfectly, you know, at least one of your shots. You have to tr your motion has to be matched with him exactly so that his eye, or at least, you, know, his eye you want to get the eye sharp. If the eye is sharp, you can have a lot of blur in other parts of the picture, and it's okay. People, you know, it's, it's, still, it's still satisfying or okay to look at. If the eye is really blurry, it's usually not, uh, not worth looking at. So, you know, out of a whole series of bristles, I followed this guy as he was foraging along one of the lines of tamarisk trees, and I kept moving along and hoping he was going to keep running by, and I would try to get him as he ran by, and then I would move along and get him as he ran by, and after a lot of tries, I got, I got this shot. A couple of the other birds also that I photographed just by kind of looking around the property, various places, uh, the, the red-shafted flicker that just passes through. He's not there all year, but passes through certain seasons. And uh, I photographed him this way because I like the way his feathers on his back, the pattern, kind of match the bark of the tree. And so I made it more about the pattern and just put the bird over at the side of the frame. And then one of the local crowd favorites, the uh, vermilion flycatcher, This uh, species is one of the you know, most brightly colored birds we have here. Uh, he was uh, fairly predictable because uh, he, he had a uh, territory, and I could usually find him actually right behind the visitor center on that big grassy lawn. He was usually there uh, in many mornings uh, feeding in the grass on insects and, and then flying back up to the tree. And so uh, actually this is one of the example, one of the shots I shot on the, the red cinema camera where, because I, as I was filming him, uh, as he flew up and down, and, and uh, but I was able to pull a, a still frame from the, the red cinema camera. <clears throat> so, as I mentioned, I also was really intrigued by the possibilities of photographing around the ponds and the water. And one thing that I really liked is, a lot of times, especially early in the morning, there'd be no wind, it'd be glass calm, there'd be great reflections, like this reflection of the cloud with the water lilies here, or nice reflections of of reeds and patterns of plants growing in the, in the ponds. And so I kind of got into this mode of trying to look for cool ways to, uh, to photograph the birds with reflections and, and also with different color backgrounds. And so I would try to... Uh... <laughs> Sorry, I'm just concerned about those lights. Okay, <clears throat> I see what's going on back there. Um, so this is a little snowy egret and the key thing about photographing with reflections is to really pay attention to the background, you know, what's reflecting in the water, because if, if I, by changing my position a little bit, I could really change the color of the water depending on what was on the other side. So in this case, there was a, a small bush being lit by the afternoon sun, kind of a golden, had a cold, kind of a golden glow, and that's what created this golden color in the water. Right? But if I just moved a little bit over, I would have just had the sky in, and it would have been all white. And so uh, it really, uh, by paying attention to the backgrounds and, and moving around to get to line up the burrs with a colorful background reflecting, I was able to get some interesting shots. So here's the mallard. I think one of the underappreciated birds because they're so common we kind of ignore them, but they're actually very colorful. And this uh, drake here swimming, swimming gently toward me through the ripples. Uh, was one, one example there. And I also tried to get the mallards in flight, like this male landing, because they're, uh, you almost never see uh, that beautiful purple color on the secondary feathers unless they have their wings open, right? So by getting him coming in for a landing, doing a little water skiing, as you see him doing there as he, as he lands, uh, I was able to capture that. And of course, there are many birds that breed on the Sunny Lands property. And one uh, day in the spring, I spotted this uh, mallard with her chicks, little ducklings. And another thing that's really important in bird photography or any kind of photography, wildlife photography, is, is like what level you're shooting from. You, you want to, especially with birds that are on the water like this, you, you want to get down really low. So I actually spent a lot of time lying on my belly uh, trying to get close to 
close to birds. Well, here I was like right on the edge of the pond uh, in order to get this kind of nice low perspective, this intimate perspective where you feel like you're on their level. If, if I was standing up and shooting down, it wouldn't have nearly the same kind of impact. But of course, it's mostly the ducklings that make the shot because it's just, they're just so cute, right? <clears throat> and here, are, here's a pair of widgeons having a little rest on the water. I think this is one of the shots I made from one of my blinds where I had, was hiding inside the blind and the ducks had flown in and were just relaxing there. And uh, what I like about this shot is the way that the color pattern of the bird with the black and white and the green highlight on the head kind of matched really well with the reflections in the water too. So we also had black and white and green reflections in the water. So I kind of like the way that those things uh, kind of came together. So yeah, the reflections are really interesting. Sometimes you can get a whole multitude of colors like that depending on the background, or sometimes you can get all one color uh, almost, like this case where this little pie-billed grebe was foraging in one of the ponds one morning, very actively sort of popping up in all different places. And I kept moving around uh, on the other side of the pond, kind of far away from him with, with a big lens, trying to line him up so he came up in front of these brightly sunlit trees on the other side to get this really uniform color and, and beautiful reflection there. This is the western grebe, one of the other grebes. Now, when, I've been photograph when I was photographing at Sunnylands, I really didn't have to worry about uh, hazards to my camera. Like in the jungle, I always have to have these rain waterproof camera covers and things because it might start pouring at any minute. And in, uh, I didn't really have that worry here in Sunnylands. And so what, but I had an experience when I made this picture. Uh, I was driving around with my golf cart, looked, checking the different ponds, and I spotted this guy from far in the distance uh, on one of the ponds. It was actually the first western grebe I'd seen, so I was excited. I was like, wow, it's a new species. Because one of the other goals of this project was, besides creating a gallery exhibit, I was also asked to try to photograph as many different species as I could, at least to get good ID shots, because Sunnylands may want to make you know, a field guide or some kind of public education materials using bird pictures. So I was trying to get pictures of at least every species that I could. And so I was like, okay, I've got to get a western grebe. So, I don't have that one yet. So I got off the golf cart, I parked it really far away, and I started walking across the grass, the fairway. And as I got a little closer, I took what's called an insurance shot. So like, you know, at least get one shot before he maybe gets spooked from far away. He wasn't very big in the frame. And I kept doing that. As I get closer, I have to get lower, because birds like this, if you approach them standing up, when you get close, they're gonna get spooked. But the, the smaller you make yourself, the less spooked they'll be. So as I got closer, I started crawling, and then as I got even closer to the edge of the pond, I started, uh, first I started kind of hunching, and then as I got really close, I started doing the army crawl. I just kind of pushed the camera in front of me and like crawl on the grass, inching my way over to the edge of the very edge of the pond. And I had just gotten there when uh, the sprinklers started popping out of the ground, <laughs> like up the other end of the fairway. And I was like, and then the next one a little bit closer to me. And the next one, and I was like, oh no. So I basically had two options. I didn't have a waterproof camera cover with me because I wasn't in Borneo. So, and my golf cart was on the other side of the fairway. So I had two choices. I could either like jump up and run and uh, spook the bird for sure, or I figured I could just put the camera underneath my chest, lie on top of it, and wait for the sprinkler to go by, you know, finish doing its thing. So that's what I did. I just lay there, I got a little shower. Uh, but kept the camera dry, and then when the sprinklers went off, because it was just a very quick watering cycle, then I uh, got the camera back out and I got this picture. So I think it was well worth it, and it was a refreshing little shower. So the other birds that hang around the, the ponds were the, include the egrets. This is a silhouette, early morning. The egrets often roosted up in the trees, and I saw this one against the early morning uh, sky. Being out, this is the benefit of being out there before sunrise. Uh, but then when they're down foraging, I also uh, photographed the great egrets a lot, foraging among the lily pond pads and uh, cattails around the pond. And here's a, a flight shot I also got by following these guys. So they would often fly from the pond, you know, fly back up into a tree to rest. Um, and here's the great blue heron, of course, the biggest heron that we have around here. Uh, <coughs> Again, this guy, he let me get pretty close. I kind of gradually worked my way toward him until uh, uh, he eventually decided to fly over to the other side of the pond, and uh, I got this shot as he was taking off, kind of an unusually close view of a great blue heron. Um, I also caught him at a little bit of an awkward moment when he was, <laughs> he was scratching himself on the, on the head or on the neck, uh, and out of the series of pictures of all the scratching, I got this funny one. 
of him. <clears throat> and here's one of the other birds that uh, actually I only saw once, not a common bird around here, but this is a white-faced ibis. And uh, just really beautiful in the subtleness of the different color tones that it has in its plumage. Very iridescent, rich tones. And so I was uh, excited to uh, spot this bird one day, and, and he actually hung around for a while. I was able to get pretty close and uh, get a series of images of him. And then the biggest, the biggest uh, water bird that we have is the white pelican, and it, they were not there all the time, but they also used Sunnylands as a stopover point, it seemed like during migration, and uh, they were often appeared out of nowhere overnight. They'd go out in the morning and be like, whoa, there are pelicans on the pond. Uh, so it was really cool to see them. All right, so now I'm going to move on to talk about some of the photography I did around the flowers. These are some poppies that I just shot with a wide lens on the grounds there. <clears throat> but whenever there are flowers blooming, and, the, and there are many, as you know, gar uh, flowers over there in Sunnylands, uh, they're uh, you know, a magnet for the bird life. And so I spent a lot of time uh, working on photographing the flowers and the birds coming to them like this verdant. Uh, this is... Uh, a bird that tends to steal nectar, but it kind of pierces, makes little holes at the base of the flowers, so it's not really what the flower wants. They want a, birds that will actually get, help spread the pollen. But this guy, uh, these, 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 and I selected this particular flower because it was isolated from all the rest. It had a, it was able to get a nice background and, and just waited for, I saw the verdins come into this one, I thought they were going to come back, and I just kind of framed up and waited for them to come back. And one day, in another uh, patch of those same aloes, I, uh, I photographed another verdin as he was foraging around. And just these are just the, the flowering stalks of the aloes forming this pattern. But one of the things I really like to experiment with is really to vary up my lighting style. And I especially like photographing with backlighting. You may, you know, in your Photography 101 course or something, they might tell you to shoot with the sun behind you, but that's really not that interesting. It's much better to try, to try a variety of lighting, and especially backlighting is, can be beautiful if you do, if you do it right. Uh, so that's one of my favorites, actually. And um, this little guy, I mean, not flowers, but it kind of falls into the same category because this Buick's wren is very territorial, and he can be predictably found in one area of the garden perched on these leaves. And so I was able to, uh, you know, find him on several occasions and document the way he very... Uh, proudly kind of stood there and calling and defend, you know, defending his territory. <clears throat> but of course, one of the most uh, attractive and, for a photographer, intriguing subjects are, of course, the hummingbirds that we have here. And so here's a little video footage of Acosta's hummingbird male. And over in the gallery, we have a, an eight-minute film that I, I made, um, jointly with my, uh, whoops. Okay, this we're good. Um, so yeah, I hope you have a chance to check out the film. I have a, there's a, so these are, I'm showing you a couple little videos, little snippets from that film, but we have an eight-minute film about the Birds of Sunnylands that's playing over at the gallery. And but this I also just want to mention, this is a frame, uh, again, that the uh, Red Digital Cinema camera gave me a chance to shoot hummingbirds like that um, and then also pull individual frames. So, like this is a frame from the, from the Red camera that we made into successfully in, into a print. And it's really great to be able to do both. It's not completely, uh, as you saw, the Red camera is bigger and I can't run after a bird, you know, handhold it and chase it and get pictures as easily. So I still use both um, and they're also, limitations on, if you're shooting video, you need to have shutter speeds that are appropriate for video, where you have some motion. Uh, and so, uh, you don't, I can't basically use, use the movie camera for all the types of shots I'm showing you. But it was really great to have both and do a combination and be able to do still photography and uh, video at the same time. So, besides costas, the other, another species that we have here is Anna's hummingbird. There's an Anna's hummingbird male coming in toward the flowers. And also, uh, one of the big clusters of flowers that grow, is growing out there at Sunnylands are 
these honeysuckles. And so there were a lot of hummingbirds around these honeysuckles, really uh, sort of fun to try to make interesting pictures there. Because it's a bit busy, but so what I did was I, I kind of took this approach of looking down the row and using very narrow depth of field. And so that's one of the reasons I use those big lenses with the big aperture, because that allows you to get more light, but it also allows you to uh, shoot with a very narrow depth of field by, by using a, a lens like that 400 f2.8 wide open, in other words, shooting at the widest aperture, gives me a very narrow depth of field where I can blur the foreground, blur the background, and that's really a nice way to isolate your subject. And you, like you see here in a little closer shot, uh, so I was really consciously thinking about, you know, and moving myself around to create that kind of glow of color in the background and get that in the right place in the frame. All right, it's all part of about, about of composing the shot, is thinking about how the out-of-focus part of the picture is going to look as well. So this is a female's uh, cost as hummingbird, I think. But besides the hummingbirds, you know, in action feeding, I also wanted to document sort of little other moments of their lives, you know, because it's, you, you don't see as many pictures of hummingbirds away from the flowers. And so I'd also watch them and see where they perched, because they would often, they would go feed, they'd do a little circuit around, then they'd go and rest somewhere for a few minutes, not long, and then they'd go feed again. So I'd find their little resting spots, and I would wait for them to come to the back of those, um, and get little shots like this, like, you know, hummingbird like stretching his wings just before he took off, or preening, here's a hummingbird scratching his beak on the, branched, keeping it clean, or even just a wider shot that I purposely shot from a little bit of a distance to show this little delicate bird and how they can perch on such small little tendrils uh, against a nice you know, autofocus background. And here's another uh, species of, of Hesperello that was flowering one of, the, one of my visits and was attracting hummingbirds, and I just love the way this looks with the backlighting. So I shot this all backlit. Beautiful little birds. And but I also, you know, so here are some stills from the same situation. Uh, where these are, then these are shot on the still camera with a very high shutter speed to freeze the wing. So this is like about a four thousandth of a second to be able to freeze the hummingbird wing in place. Uh, you see the little drops of nectar spilling out there that he, as he pulled back out of the flower. Um, I kind of like this one. You can see the shadow of the flower on the, on the wing of the hummingbird as he's... It's what I find amazing about these birds is how, how they're flying, they're moving their wings so fast, and yet their heads, their beaks are completely steady, and they can just like, you know, move in and out of these flowers very delicately. Really, really cool to watch. They're operating on a completely different time frame than we are. Here's another little video sequence from the... Uh, aloe vera flowers, and the hummingbirds coming there. And I, what I did here is I pulled some images from the, from the video footage, and what I found amazing was that although the, in this video footage, because the shutter speed is not high, like 4 thousandths of a second. I was shooting at a good speed for video, which is about a 200th of a second or 150th of a second. Um, so, because in the video, you, want, you don't want the wings to look all choppy. When it's, when it's, that's why you need to shoot a little at a slower shutter speed in video, so you see that natural motion. Um, but of course, when you look at a single frame of the video, the wings are going to be blurred. But the amazing thing is, because the hummingbird's head is so steady, you know, it's holding in place so well that even these frames have kind of a nice effect. It's kind of nice to have some shots where the wings are blurred, but the head is sharp. And so uh, that's another kind of slightly different style that I could, uh, you know, create photographs of the hummingbirds um, from, the, from the video camera. Now, as I mentioned, I was always out there at sunrise, and sometimes I was here at the right time for the full moon, and of course the full moon sets right as the sun is rising, right? And so I, I got some beautiful uh, views of the moon setting over the mountains. Uh, 
And one morning, I saw uh, that it was just getting light, but the hummingbirds were already waking up and starting to forage on the, the honeysuckle. And I saw that I could get myself in a position to line up the moon right behind the honeysuckle. And so I, uh, my, I had this idea to try to get a shot of a hummingbird in front of the moon. I thought, well, that's maybe that hasn't been done before. I don't know. But um, so anyway, I worked for a while as long as, as long as I could until the moon set. I, uh, I kept trying to um, line up a flower and then hope a hummingbird would come to that flower, you know, that was right next to the moon. And uh, eventually, uh, just in time before the moon set, this bird came into the right spot and I got that picture. So, um, so that's my final shot for the presentation. So uh, thank you very much.